Okay. First off, thank you all so much for tuning in today. It's always such a pleasure to hop on these office hours and just learn along each other um, and to honestly just catch up, um, you know, in these crazy times. First, a bit of background information on our esteemed expert. Bulbul has worked in impact investing since before it was even called that. She started her career in microfinance in emerging slash frontier markets pivoted to working more in the U.S. after the 2008 financial crisis when the U.S. wealth inequality looked like developing countries and as the impact investing market was emerging. She led this portfolio for many years at the Clinton Foundation and now is CEO of an organization that is helping shape impact investing best practices and public policy on impact investing and what it can look like in the domestic market. Bulbul has also taught impact investing at NYU since 2015 and now at Berkeley starting this month. So I don't know if you started already, but should be coming soon. So thank you so much, Bulbul, for taking the time to teach us about your expertise today. We know how valuable your time is and we can't wait to learn from you today. Oh, thanks so much for that really kind intro, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, I just joined as a member this past year too, so it's uh, interesting to get more engaged with the community as well. Um, and wherever I can actually be useful, that <laughs> much more help, happy to engage. Um, so I thought I would start with a little bit more of my um, journey than what Hannah shared, just to um, talk a little bit more about how I got into this, this work um, uh, and happy to, hear any questions, reflections. Um, I was saying to Hannah earlier that my journey into this work was so circuitous. And I think that's true for so many founders, startup uh, entrepreneurs, leaders I know. Um, and uh, you know, would love to hear your questions as we go on any part of um, both my background and uh, obviously what, what we work on and what um, impact investing can look like and how you might be engaging with it. I would love to hear more about that as well. Um, and then I uh, figured I would share just a little bit more around um, impact investing sort of 101 in terms just to make sure we're all on the same page about how we talk about impact investing. Um, uh, but throughout, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to jump in and unmute yourself and, and uh, share. Um, uh, or if you want to drop something into chat, Hannah and I can look out for it um, for questions or comments as well. Um, so uh, I guess to start a little bit more around uh, my background, um, I, so as a child, <laughs> I'm going to go all the way back. Um, I grew up in Delhi, India until I was about nine or so. Um, and my father, um, Co well joined a tech company my uncle had started here in Connecticut in outside of New York, uh, and slowly brought many of our our family members over. Um, so I went from 15 million, 12 million, and maybe at the time brown people in Delhi, <laughs> New Delhi, bustling city, to suburban Connecticut, uh, where I was the first kid of color that my fifth grade elementary school had ever seen. Um, and I say that as sort of a formational time in my life, right? I was nine at the time. Um, and just really thinking through like, why do people here have things and access that others don't? And it was really the first time I think that thought process um, started in my mind more so. Um, and how do I help solve for this cognitive dissonance I'm seeing around me that, you know, you, you sort of analyze from different perspectives growing up. Um, and I got started, I guess I would say in my, um, sort of career journey in college as a, um, college organizer uh, around social justice issues. Um, and then first worked on and off Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, um, really around like policy advocacy for, um, at the time, welfare reauthorization and social safety nets work. Um, really trying to put my econ career to more social justice. And that's really where I first, um, I guess, brought together my muscles of um, sort of mission and purpose to um, what skill sets I was interested in using and the kinds of systems change um, 
I was exploring and interested in. So this uh, eventually sort of pivoted into a career in the US government early on, um, and then working in philanthropy, public-private partnerships, um, and uh, in microfinance back in India for a little bit. Um, but really, I say all of that just to say that um, picking up along those paths, questions around inequality, systems, um, the financial system, uh, policy um, system, um, our banking system and uh, putting in place how we might use finance, economics, policy to shape a better path where we actually center social justice and social impact work further. Um, I was personally just really starting to do that in my career when this concept of impact investing was emerging. So um, I think the earliest conversations I remember around socially responsible and impact investing for me in my life were around 2005. Um, that was the first time I had just moved to California the first time. It was the first time that uh, retail investment products in micro lending and microfinance were being introduced for where investors um, who maybe traditionally thought of it as philanthropic capital or um, were interested in doing early stage investing um, could take a much lower interest at the time or return at the time, um, but do something socially impactful like invest in microfinance in emerging countries at the time. Um, and slowly, that's where some of the earliest work in impact investing kind of came from is like, what could microfinance further look like in the US um, and the crowdfunding legislation that we uh, passed in the late Obama administration um, and put in place just different policies that, uh, especially with the Obama White House in 2013, um, when I was at the Clinton Foundation and we were working with them on um, launching the US's first ever task force on impact investing as part of this broader international um, G8 effort to uh, really build up this industry and how to have the conversations of like, well, what is impact investing? What, what does it need to look like that's different from traditional investing? Um, and how do we build a common language, common terms in the early years of the industry so that we're all sort of speaking from the same page when we say impact investing? Um, and doing that kind of work is what slowly, not just brought me into pulling together these different policy, financial system, economic justice conversations more from my background into the work that we do and into the um, field as it built. Uh, and then further into this role specifically that I, I now run in the last year and a quarter <laughs> um, as CEO of Pacific Community Ventures, which is um, an organ is a nonprofit organization we, we're on, one part of our business is doing community lending um, as a community development financial institution, uh, specifically focused on investing in underserved people and places that would otherwise have a hard time accessing capital from banks or even SBA, um, uh, which really the CDFI industry really came out of the civil rights legislation in the US 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. Um, and another part of our business is running our impact investing research and consulting practice, um, which includes a lot of our impact investing policy work. And where those two come together is a pretty unique nexus um, that PCV um, holds in the market around being both a practitioner, actually investing directly into small and growing businesses with underserved and underinvested people and places and then actually helping to make recommendations for what national impact investing policy can and should look like to help build the overall field and the infrastructure that we still need. Um, so uh, I, I just want to pivot um, into just very, so a couple of very basic terms for how we define impact investing. Um, and then I'll pause for any questions or reflections. Um, so when we say impact investing, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here, 
um, the go-to, I guess, holders maybe of the definition and key terms for impact investing, if anyone's interested in looking at this up, um, are generally considered the uh, this nonprofit organization called the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, G-I-I-N.org, I think. Um, uh, but when we when we say impact investing, the key the two kind of key differentiators um, for how we think about it are one: Are you going into this investment or creating this impact investing approach for yourself with an intentionality for some version of social or environmental impact? So the intent piece is a huge differentiator from traditional investing. Um, and the second key component of that traditionally, or for the last 10, 11 years, <laughs> since we sort of started to coin the term impact investing, um, is measurement. So you're coming into this with this intent. Are you then also measuring the outcomes of that intent and that portfolio of impact investing so that you're really learning, is that intent actually showing up in your investment portfolios? And we as a field are learning, what does it actually really look like to do impact investing versus traditional investing? And how do we make sure we continue to stay adaptive and learning and improve on that? So the intent and the measurement pieces have been traditionally what in, in the last several years has been the focus of differentiating from traditional investing. Um, I guess the last piece I would just add in terms of definition and term setting is in the last few years, there's been a lot more conversation around uh, increasing transparency in the field and collaborative structures for, um, as we know, you know, the biggest wealth transfer in global history is we're, we're undergoing it. We've been in it for the last five or six years uh, and it's uh, projected to go through the next 20 years or so. Um, of uh, asset transfers from the baby boomer generation to millennials and Gen Z. Um, and one of the biggest shifts we've seen with that wealth transfer is more and more people, millennials, Gen Z, but also just more women consumers coming into wealth. Uh, and we know in the US, for example, um, the last two years have been the first time that women have owned 51% of assets in this country. Um, which I think is still a decently kept secret, apparently, except with family offices, um, because we've seen a lot of families and individuals um, who want to have more impact investing in their portfolios um, either pull out of traditional asset managers and big banks who've traditionally managed their capital for them into family offices or investment firms that have an impact um, thesis and have an impact approach um, and align their dollars more and more with their values and their mission um, or are currently undergoing that shift. And so with that really comes um, more conversation around transparency, measurement. Um, are we learning? Are we improving our intent and outcomes in the impact side of things? Or I think the the challenge has also been, as we see more and big money coming into this space, um, are we at risk for impact washing where, um, similar to, I think, in the environmental and sustainability space, blue washing or green washing, I think, one's oceans, one's uh, environment otherwise, um, where we're not using the term so dilutively that people are sort of using the term impact as cover to do a host of things that isn't actually impact investing. It's much weaker than that or diluted than that. Um, so I would just sort of set that as the stage and sorry if that was a lot, but um, I just thought some of those concepts and terms might be key for a base level conversation. And I'm sure some of you know a lot more about impact than that, um, but would love to pause there and hear any reflections or questions and where some of you are on this uh, impact journey or what brought you here today. Thank you so much for giving that amazing foundation overview of this. I think that was really helpful. Um, everyone feel free to unmute yourself or drop in the comments um, what brought you here today, 
um, what you're working on, um, and if you have any questions. Hi, Hello. I am Rosario. How are you? Thank you for sharing. Uh, I, 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 with COVID, let's say, with co when COVID started, uh, my husband and I decided to convert a consulting company taking all the knowledge from previous years of digital transformation advisory and converted that or, or created a core program. It is a community with, a, with an incubator program for small business owners, owners who are not tech businesses. It means who need, really need to, to adapt to the new digital reality. And we started with the knowledge, the content, everything, just because of the urgency from the market. I mean, it was a need. And, and we just started. And now that we are figuring the business model just to make it sustainable, uh, we, we, when I saw your presentation, what's happening today, I was like, I would love to see if we can match in, in that world of impact investment or what could be interesting because of course small businesses are the majority of the are the core of the economies everywhere and non-technical businesses are the majority of the real businesses but nobody is giving them the funds to adapt and to transform that's why we created the incubator but of course we need to uh, now we need to make a, a business model from the from the from what we created and do you think it could match or is just, uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know about uh, impact investment at all. I, I'm more in technology, but I saw the need. Then wh what did you think around that? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So um, the organization I work with now, um, Pacific Community Ventures, that is what we do. So we, um, our investment portfolio is entirely with small businesses that are more traditional main street businesses, mom and pop businesses, and, and or you know, slightly larger, um, uh, you know, more kind of in-person brick and mortar than tech company businesses, traditionally speaking. And so these, these are the businesses that I think you're talking about, at least the US version, yes. um, who have been underinvested, who are not necessarily strong on technology because they don't see themselves as technology enabled or tech businesses, right? They're main street shops, restaurants, um, retail, yes, all kinds of different, yeah. So one of the things that we have done in our, in our work, um, pulling from some of the best practices from venture, which is how we were founded as an organization 20 years ago, um, is alongside our investment, we also have all of our portfolio companies and we provide this across the country as well, um, be matched with an advisor on our businessadvising.org platform so that they not only get a check from us in terms of an investment, but it comes with at least a financial advisor to start um, for their business, financial planning, et cetera. And then through that platform, they can access additional mentors in marketing, digital marketing, which as you rightly note is hugely in demand right now, um, strategy, HR, all of the different kinds of expertise areas so that they can really have that um, support that a lot of venture backed startups and founders get that no one really provides for small and growing businesses the same way. Um, so I think that's what I hear you talking about a lot. Um, and I don't know where it is that you operate globally or in the US, um, but happy to, to connect um, offline if that's helpful too. Thank you. No, I would love to. Uh, we operate in a mix between uh, the three state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Colombia, South America. We have half and half of the court uh, also to increase the, I don't know the word for this remesa, the money that uh, people in uh, foreign people is sending to Latin America, to their families, then we are increasing the, the commercial exchange between companies in both geographies. I'm a Latina, I'm Colombian, then for sure I have my bias. <laughs> yeah, there's, interesting. there's been some really interesting work done in um, uh, impact investing and um, international development finance using remittances 
that you're talking about. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, for how remittance money is invested in the receiving country, both at the country level and at the individual family and community level um, to help further like community development uh, and priorities, stuff like that. That's great. No, because, well, we, sorry for taking the time, but, but uh, I, I really allocate my time uh, between uh, a technology company where I do the majority of my time. But uh, this was like, we saw a need and we had the expertise to, to transform the companies, to, to, to move them. But, but for sure, we need, it, we need to move it forward and make it sustainable, yes. for sure. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. No. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, ch I'll chime in. Thank you so much for, for having, for, for talking about this. I um, just saw Impact Investing and signed up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, um, I'm about to start my fundraising journey. I have a company called Hey Kiddo, and it's dedicated to building leadership, social, and emotional skills in, in children, but mostly they're grownups. So the grownups can model it at home. Um, and um, we have, um, yeah, so I'm just about to start this process and I have been, I'm very new to this and I'm used to, I'm used to owning and operating service businesses, not tech companies. So um, I am trying to figure out what direction to go and, and what would be the best because, you know, the, the belief with the team and our goal with the team is to make the development of these skills um, an equi equitable experience. I don't believe that only people that can afford this or that happen to have parents that know how to do this should be the ones getting it. So I want to get it into the hands of every child. Um, that's the goal. I have no idea how to do that yet. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, one of the things that I'm looking at is 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 do we fit that bill for investments with with companies that want to do impact investing? So I just wanted to hear more about it and learn more about it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And as a mom of two little girls, elementary school age, yeah. something to think about every couple of hours every day, especially yeah. when they are homeschooling in the living room and one is practicing her recorder right now. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just and as a divorced mom, that much more making sure uh, so hard. we're not really screwing them up. I don't know. Am I allowed to swear on this? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come out eventually. <laughs> you know. um, but yes, it's something I think about. And for my team at work, right? Like, especially through this crisis, um, we are on the front lines of small businesses in great distress and challenge. And their workers who are largely black and brown workers in a whole host of distress, economically, yep. racial injustice, protests, curfews, all kinds of stuff. And yeah, just really making sure we're doubling down on that for our team and the communities we reach yeah. is um, very much part of how we bring impact and social justice to our work. Um, and is part of why I think I feel like part of my role in the impact investing world has always been to make sure um, we are actually impact first. And it, it's still a controversial concept in the impact investing industry which drives me nuts that that's controversial. But um, to me, if we're not putting impact first, then what the fuck are we doing impact right. investing for? Right. That's what traditional investing is. Right. So if you're looking for market rate returns off the bat in impact investing, I mean, I get it, but man, like you're probably not, oh, I, I shouldn't say this publicly. You're probably not my people um, yeah. because that's not, that's not really game changing. That's the highest risk of impact washing. Um, because if you're not looking at how we build a better future yeah. and what does that look like for the right type of capital towards the kind of impact you say you want to have and you're actually aligning your dollars with it, then why are you doing impact investing other than to get money from people who don't really know impact investing and are just happy to he, happy to have your their money with someone who says they're doing impact investing right and there are plenty of those to go around unfortunately um right. sorry so back to your yeah. con um your <laughs> position got me on a tirade there um i like that tirade <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you need to hear that tirade 
Um, I know my students get to hear it more. My team probably hears it enough. Um, I think a couple of quick things from the entrepreneur side. So yeah. um, I purposefully spent a couple of years working with impact startups <laughs> between roles because I very much wanted to do the founder and tech impact tech platform side of things for a while. Um, I think one thing maybe that is often unclear for founders interested in pitching to impact investors, every time I come across this, people are always wondering, what do I lead with? Do I lead with impact or do I lead with traditional business and finance pitch? Um, which side do they care more about, <laughs> right? Um, and first of all, I mean, just with any investor you're talking to, know your investor. <laughs> it is not a generic investor pitch. Each person will care about something different and their fund thesis and, you know, where their capital comes from will help, for better or for worse, decide, right, the risk or the way they translate impact in a way that um, fits for their organization or team. Um, but that said, I still think nine times out of 10 or nine and a half times out of 10, um, most impact investors I know still are looking for a sound business startup, financial projections for them to feel comfortable investing in and sharing that investment with their network, right? For potential, uh, potential additional investment. Um, and side-by-side -side impact analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so I still think, you know, the traditional sort of founder pitch of the, I don't know, maybe it's more traditional now, it didn't used to be, the 10 slide deck and, you know, kind of best practice still works in the impact investing industry. And whether it's um, pivoting one or two of those into problem solution that has that centers the impact you want to have that much more around mental health and social emotional development and the power of role modeling, which you already pointed out, um, and the neuroscience literature yeah. that proves that over and over and over. Yeah. Um, uh, to having a good product and having some sound financial projections is never gonna never gonna go wrong for you. Right. Um, but there are more impact investors certainly taking a look at mental health and well-being in the last two or three years. Um, I think it sounds to me generally like the folks you're probably going to go after the most have probably been folks who are working in ed tech the longest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's been a big growing space in the impact space right. uh, world for a few years. So um, you'll have a you'll have a good start. Of, of I think it's straddling parent tech, ed tech, and behavioral health tech. Um, mm -hmm. It's straddling everything. <laughs> but yeah, I think it is ed tech. Okay, thank you. Yeah, happy to. I feel like when I started on my tirade and got more real, a bunch of people came on video all of a sudden. They're like, all right, I want to engage. <laughs> the F-bomb works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear a lot more at work because I have kids at home and now I'm like, shit, can I swear? Oh, wait. Okay. Good doors are closed. My 21 month old just started saying the F-bomb and I take full responsibility because it's constant. So oops. <laughs> Glad I'm teaching these skills. <laughs> um, hi, I had a quick question. Um, thank you for taking this time. And I um, am on a second company. My first company was like sort of a first iteration crowdfunding tool for people going through cancer treatment. So I felt much more well-versed in sort of all things, crowdfunding, microfinance, et cetera, back in 2012 when I was doing that. Um, and I was just sort of wondering if in this, like, in this sort of new space of like the evolution of tech, that's my dog whining. I don't know if you can hear any strange noises, but um, if you have any sense of how there's been any change in the measurement of impact as technology has evolved, if like things that are maybe outside of the more brick and mortar kind of space, like around mental health, trauma, like things that are less possibly tangible than like resource, tangible resource oriented things. Do you see anything about 
do you, or is there anything new in your sort of field of view in how impact is being measured around sort of social, emotional, trauma related things in the impact space? Yeah, no, good question. And um, I, yeah, it's great to hear more folks uh, working on a very needed silent epidemic uh, we, we have in this uh, country. Um, so a couple of couple of thoughts. One is when we think about impact metrics and measurement, um, there's, there's a couple of options out there, but for the most part, the um, set of metrics um, and definitions that uh, more people use than not, <laughs> um, and that a lot of industry folks spend a lot of time working to build collaboratively, um, is still housed at the GIN. Um, the Global Impact Investing Network I was mentioning. And a lot of us have worked with them over the years to adapt those metrics and make them better and better on environment, oceans, um, job quality, racial justice, lots of different elements. Um, and I'm pretty sure they added health and well being more so under health stuff. So, in terms of just like common metrics that enough impact investors have thought about that would get to the IRIS framework of metrics. I think that's probably a good one-stop shop if you haven't looked at that already. Um, the, the two or three maybe other smaller collaboratives thinking about mental health and trauma and impact combined. Um, one is there's a group of social entrepreneurs that's a combination of nonprofits. I think it's mostly nonprofit tech impact businesses. Um, out of a, a incubator called Fast Forward. I think it's Bay Area based. Um, but in the last three or four years, they've had more and more folks um, in the incubator doing some combination of mental health and trauma. And so um, just as a group wise, there might be some really interesting learnings there because that, yeah, that's always nice. And then there's a couple of impact investors who are investing more into mental health and, and well being and trauma. Um, and just the two that come to mind first, just in case that's interesting to look at their portfolio and approach. Um, one is Backstage Capital run by Arlen Hamilton. Um, and another is Sparrow Ventures, S-P-E-R-O dot V-C, I think, which spun out of the Umidyar network a couple of years ago, um, uh, which is a very early practitioner of impact investing in the country world. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I will look at those and I, I yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll jump in and um, if we're going to do swearing and real talk, I'll turn on my camera in my pajamas in my bed. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so uh, I am joining the call and thank you so much for your time, um, both as a, a startup founder and as a um, someone who is interested in doing um, impact investing um, myself as a, you know, individual investor. So um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Tend, and we are building um, tech-enabled solutions that help women to track and value the invisible labor of motherhood um, and give them solutions that help them to share and leverage that work more equitably. So, uh, you know, like Nicole, I'm my also um, my ex-husband. Right. Yes, I am in a similar situation. <laughs> so personal experience has led me to this path. Uh -huh. um, but it's, you know, it's such a common story of, uh, among, you know, a variety of women, whether they're happily partnered or not, um, we have this experience of, of bearing more of the load. And so much good work is doing is being done in the workplace, but I feel like there's a lot we can do in homes to help, um, you know, solve the problem as it starts early in a relationship. Um, so I'm, I'm getting ready to start a fundraising round, our pre-seed round. And, um, you know, VC is, is challenging. And for all the reasons you talked about, you know, there's all these expectations about like every company being a unicorn. And, and so, you know, I, I'd love to connect. Flag that for my next hiring. Right. I'd love to connect to these, to impact investors, um, you know, particularly maybe like, 
angels and non non um, non VC like family offices like you mentioned before, but that feels like a kind of in, impenetrable network that um, I, I don't know how to access. So if you have any um, you know advice for making connections in that world, that would be super helpful. And then on the other side, as an individual investor, you know advice for you know entry level sort of uh, investing myself. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so let me start with the first one. Um, parent tech is, uh, I literally just heard that term for the first time, I think three years ago when I first moved back to the Valley. Um, uh, there's a couple of groups. Um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of like Femterra, Famterra, maybe FAM Terra. Uh, there's a couple of startups that have been trying to tackle this around, mm -hmm. uh, actually this one was specifically around parent sharing too, um, which is interesting for co-parenting. Um, but in terms of, I think, A, still a fairly new genre, um, but approaching potential angel or impact investors, um, I think especially for women-led founders, uh, women-led startups or women founders, um, uh, there's, I don't know if you, have considered or approached or ever connected with the groups that are really trying to build cohorts of women founders into their investment portfolio. So um, there's Plum Alley Investments started out of New York. Um, that's where I, I think I did my one of my first angel investments or, or um, syndicates um, mm -hmm. portfolio that's based out of here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, well, Elevest, right, is a retail investment platform, but bringing women founders on as businesses. Um, and then there's another one that's completely blanking my mind, run by Ori, also in the Bay Area. Crap. Anyway, it'll come to me. That's okay. Um, we'll but figure it out. My approach would be more to think about how to enter into them, um, because they're, they have been doing a lot of work around specifically how do you best tackle um, women asset owners who are looking into how to become investors, angel venture and impact investors and women investing in women. So um, especially when you're also creating or helping create a new genre, um, that feels to me like the best possible setup to walk into. Um, thank you for all of the links coming into this chat. That's awesome. Um, secondly, on the personal side, and then um, happy to pause for a minute. Um, uh, I think Backstage was one of my first <laughs> personal investments in shifting my dollars out of a traditional 401k and into um, walking my impact language in the last few years uh, more and more. And uh, personally, a few years ago, as I started this journey, I made the commitment to invest only in women of color fund managers and founders and or co-founders um, because personally for me, that's where I see the biggest deficit and that I want to really be specifically focused in my impact because I'm, I'm still a baby angel, personally speaking. Um, but finding, yeah, finding your crew and figuring out you know, are you invested in a traditional 401k? Is there a more impact uh, or sustainable um, fund that fits your values better? Um, uh, is there retail investment options that are now available that, you know, might make sense for you to start with experimenting even um, and just learn from? And I think that's part of been, that's been part of the beauty of platforms like Elevest and some of these other collaboratives because the intent is also for women to be learning with each other and alongside each other. Um, so it, it might be personally beneficial and for you as a founder to find one or two of these communities that really fits and see um, what what feels right. Have you done that yet or approached them um, or talked to them? Yeah, I, I have not. And this, this is excellent advice, both from, um, you know, I, I'm surprised at the, at the overlap that <laughs> between my two questions um, if, with these communities. So I, I'm familiar with Backstage and I've, I've considered investing with them and both reaching and reaching out to them as a founder. But, um, but some of these other ones are new to me. So thank you so much. This is right. really excellent advice. 
Happy to. Hi. I'll, I'll jump up. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, Olga. No, no, after you. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. So um, you asked why I am here. So my startup is an HR tech company where I focus on helping experienced Black, Latina, and Indigenous women who are scientists, engineers, and technology professionals get management roles in corporate America. For whatever reason, when I lead with Black, Latina, and Indigenous women, I'm a nonprofit. The people who understand that I am not a nonprofit <laughs> uh, organization, and this is especially early on, um, are usually social impact investors and they understand the problem. They understand that it is not a nonprofit. And so that's why I tend to focus mostly on social impact because I'm not asked the dumb questions. So put to put it shortly. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And I didn't think that was sharp at all. <laughs> There's a lot more swearing you could have done in that sentence alone. <laughs> Um, I'm not on the construction side anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, yes, I uh, very strongly remember eight years ago, even um, when I was running the impact investing portfolio at the Clinton Global Initiative and Foundation, bringing in some of these banks and sort of bigger investors. And I would start talking impact investing to them and they'd be like, oh, you hang on. You want me to connect you to my colleague who runs CSR down the hall? Like, hang on. And immediately we're ready to you know, put me on the philanthropic side of the house. And I was like, no, 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 sit down, <laughs> like, hang on. And I, for me, it was a combination of like starting with the finance pitch and then realizing for at least the first conversation, like adding the impact in as the kicker at the end was more helpful just to like get the first conversation productive. But um, yes, unfortunately, I would say, especially for many bigger companies and bigger institutions, um, in the last several years, we've seen even more interesting developments where like CSR and impact investing slowly become more integrated. Impact investing actually isn't just like sort of uh, nice to have at the end, um, but more and more integrated into wealth management teams and um, investment teams in the big organizations. I think in the big, a lot of the big companies I see in the corporate America, having um, your D and I team or DEI team um, and, and or as part of HR still feels like uh, not integrated into how leadership is actually approaching talent, recruitment, retainment, retain, retention, retainment, just created a word. Um, and if it's not driven by like actual intention, right? We go back to the word intention. Um, and understanding of why you as a leader care about any one of these things, it will stay a nice to have, you know, tangential thing that your organization does until you intentionally speak and show why it is actually part of the bulk of your work. Um, it's, yeah, something I've been doing in my own team around our DEI conversations more broadly, um, but uh, that that culture change has to come from the leadership. And and uh, I guess the harder part, and I was in a room on Clubhouse and a lady asked the question. She was like, so I've been running my startup for five years and it's, and it's been funded by us doing services work. I went out for investment and the investors want me to stop doing the services work. And she had a <clears throat> problem with that. And I do too, because part of culture change, you can't right now at least do it via AI or tech, right? So to have people change, therapists would become computers. There would be a, there would be a code for you to go to a therapist, right? And I was like, so mine is part tech and part services. And I'm like, this is going to be really interesting because I never thought that, you know, I'm if I go out for investment, I'm really going to have a challenge with some investors because they're going to want me to stop doing the services when in actuality, that's the biggest part of the change. The data is gonna tell me 90% you, you, of the companies are shit, right? <laughs> With diversity, equity, inclusion, retaining mm -hmm. talent that doesn't look like them. And this is what the, the services part helps them change the culture to change that number. So I was like, wait, what? So I'm, I guess I'm more on the social impact side than I realize. And I do pitch with the numbers at the beginning, 
where there's how much they they pay out in um, EEOC lawsuits or in in lost talent, especially in the technical space, you're talking hundred thousand dollars just to replace one person. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't implying you may not. I was just saying that that's yeah. a lesson I learned for me. Um, uh, I don't know if you've already done this, but I, I think one of the best organizations diving into that overlap that you're talking about, um, if you're not already familiar with them, is the k Center and k yeah. Capital. Okay. Because um, they, yeah, I, I've really appreciated their voice and um, accountability in the last few years of consistently calling this out in the tech uh, industry and, and big companies and actually measuring it year over year now and showing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's great. I, I appreciate your efforts. I'm sorry. It's been frustrating. I, I mean, as much as I love impact investing, I absolutely do not think this conversation, you should be allowed, you, you, they should be allowed to redirect you to the social impact people they might be your internal champions in some way, right? Which is often important in your stakeholders. But um, yeah, that that's a red flag to me, just in terms of the person not not getting it or not being ready to make the culture change. Olga, you were going to jump in. Yes. Hi, Bulbul. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. Um, I've been uh, working with family offices on impact investing for the past six years or so. And this whole, um, the question around impact washing is an interesting one because um, I feel like uh, there's almost like a bifurcation right now happening where if you're an impact investor, it must be concessionary, it must be targeted to reach certain, certain um, demographics or, or, or certain underprivileged groups. And then if not, then it's more kind of traditional investing. And I'm wondering when, when are we going to come to kind of more of a uh, middle ground where a company can be kind of a, on, on a unicorn um, path um, and be, uh, you know, sort of aimed at a double bottom line and, and actually, um, uh, you know, intended to have uh, a world positive effect. Um, yeah, thank you for, for asking that. Um, so a couple of, a couple of thoughts. Um, and remind me if I forget one of these, concessionary, unicorn, and shit, I'm gonna remember the third one. Uh, so concessionary. Um, actually, let me back up one one second for your overall question. Um, I think similar to what I started this conversation with, um, for any invest in for any fund and any startup, similar to how you have to have a very specific vision for what impact you are intending to have with your business or your fund, right? And therefore then be able to show that impact, whether it's purely returns or social returns and financial returns. Um, in this conversation, in this industry, what I purposely started the conversation was with how are we using and defining impact for that asset owner, that fund, that startup, because if we are not coming into this with the intent to differentiate from traditional investing in some meaningful way, however that translates into impact for your organization or your fund, then why are you calling it impact investing, right? So what you're talking about earlier um, about like finding or identifying a specific um, underprivileged group or sector or something like that um, versus you know, changing the whole system, I think showing intentionally sector by sector or group by group or community, fund by fund, startup by startup, that this does in fact both pay off for society and for financial returns long-term um, is A, I think how we differentiate and B, how we grow the field aligned with impact goals and not just impact washing so the intentionality of what you're specifically trying to solve for and the measurement of it is why it is 
important as guardrails for impact versus traditional investing. Um, and then on the term concessionary, that term alone has been my biggest beef with the impact investing industry for eight years now, I think since I first really heard it being used. Um, and the, what I say about it is imagine being on the receiving, imagine being the founder pitching your business and your startup and your vision, right, to a group of investors or an investor across the table from you and hearing that they don't do concessionary capital. How does that sound? How does that feel, right? Like nobody wants to be the donation check or the, the concessionary capital, right? Similar, I think, to some of the sentiment Michelle was maybe sharing earlier. Um, that's, that's not what any founder's vision is about. And I personally find that term crazy disrespectful of the incredible hustle and energy founders put into their companies and try really hard to get impact investors to stop using it. Um, and to me, it's a sign of people coming at it from, I would like market rate financial returns but I'm willing to do things to go down market into impact because I want to do impact investing versus people coming at it from like, yeah, I really want to do impact. And I, how do I align my dollars and my efforts to have the kind of impact I want to have in the world, which is a different conversation around risk and return than coming into it with a financial return mindset first and foremost. And I totally understand that that's not um, currently the case for her, far too many investors. Um, but to me, it's, it, it's just, it's a sign of mindset for the, the team. Um, and, uh, just sorry to go on a, another tiring, but it's a, it's a beef that I have that I would really love to influence people to stop using that term. Uh, and then lastly on unicorn, um, since it came up earlier too, uh, I think three years ago was the first time we had a big impact investing conference where the concept of an impact unicorn was introduced and how great it would be for us to have these impact unicorns in the world. Um, and while that sounds great for when you're trying to build the field and bring more big capital to the field and, and maybe to some extent just big vision name and inspiration. Um, I personally have problems with both how we currently invest in unicorns in the venture space, much less bringing those practices to the impact investing industry. Um, so in the impact unicorn concept, my understanding is that the concept is like, how do we reach a million people per startup or per company? Um, and get to a billion dollar valuation. I think that's still somewhat similar. Um, and we just have so few actual impact companies and impact entrepreneurs who are even close to that, that I, for me, I really worry that we're bringing um, the not healthy practices from venture of chasing the hockey stick um, versus actually really making sure we're focused on impact um, and measuring that impact and showing that impact. Um, so it, it makes me really nervous. And uh, it's, yeah, it, it's something I would love to, again, caution on, but um, it comes with a host of bad practices in the venture industry. That is the last thing we need in impact, personally speaking. Sorry, I feel like I just lectured her out of the room. No, she just <laughs> dropped in the chat that she had to jump on another call, but she said, thank you so much for your great discussion. Um, does anyone have any last minute thoughts, questions? Almost everyone has jumped in, which is so, so fun and exciting. Um, there's not any last minute thoughts. This was so amazing, Bulbul. I can't thank you enough for pouring out all of these amazing insights and your expertise and just all the real talk we welcome it here with open arms so thank you so much for 
for everything. Um, and the chat is just blowing up, as you can see, with everyone thanking you. So wonderful, so fantastic. Um, and thank you all for showing up um, also vulnerably with your questions and being so thoughtful. Um, it's always such a pleasure to learn alongside you.